Bible is full of stories that we all know and love. But how well do we know them? The answer might surprise you. The Bible you thought you knew is going to dive deep into the exquisite details of the biblical stories that make them fascinating and transforming. In this week's podcast, we are continuing with part four of the early chapters of 1 Samuel, a narrative which features the transition from a primarily priestly ministry in Israel to a primarily prophetic one. Today, we begin with 1 Samuel chapter 4. This chapter begins with an odd statement. It says, Now the word of Samuel came to all Israel. That's in verse 1. What makes that odd? It is odd because Samuel does not say anything in the story that this statement introduces. This phrase signals that Samuel is about to speak, but he does not speak. Even stranger, Samuel does not even appear in the forthcoming episode. This anomaly has prompted translators to transfer the first verse of chapter 4 to the very last verse of chapter 3. Most English translations do just that. My argument is that the versification of the Hebrew text is just fine. This is why I think that. Virtually every time a phrase like this occurs in the Old Testament, it introduces a prophet who is about to speak. In effect, after 1 Samuel 4.1, The reader anticipates Samuel, the newly called prophet, saying something. The fact that he says nothing and does not even appear in the next episode is telling. In short, the reader is given notice that what transpires in the next incident should be seen, as it were, in a prophetic pregnant pause. Of course, a pregnant pause indicates a situation in which silence is more effective than talk. We will soon understand why the next events put in bold relief Israel going to a, in another direction at the point where Samuel was poised to speak as their newly appointed prophet. Instead of Samuel offering prophetic insight and Israel attentively listening, we encounter instead a type scene. A type scene trades on familiarity in which characters and circumstances play to type. Think, for example, of the scenes in many movies featuring old Western themes. The antagonist, or bad guy, rides into town. Typically, he is dressed in dark clothing with a black hat and is typically unshaven. He goes to the local saloon, which features not only a bartender, but the town drunk and the prostitute with a heart of gold. Quite often, the bad guy harasses the town drunk and insults the prostitute with a heart of gold. After this, he goes to the bar and orders whiskey. Before long, the protagonist, or good guy, rides into town. Typically, he is dressed in light clothes, or at least has a white hat. He has recently shaved. When he goes into the saloon, if the antagonist is harassing the town drunk or insulting the prostitute with the heart of gold, the good guy intervenes. When he finally orders a drink at the bar, it is sarsaparilla with a dash of cherry. This is a type scene. In 1 Samuel 4, the type scene has two armies facing each other. The Israelites were encamped at, in Ebenezer, and the Philistines were encamped in Aphek. The battle is about to begin. In this encounter, counterintuitively, the Philistines win a resounding victory. Israel tragically lost 4,000 soldiers. This defeat made the Israelites wonder how they could have lost so decisively. After all, they were God's elect people. 
Why had their God not helped them to ensure victory? The Israelites answered their own question. God had not shown up at the battlefield that day. They would make sure that that did not happen again. So they decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the next battle. That would surely make certain that God would be there and that they would therefore be victorious. Obviously, the Israelites believed that God was in the box, so to speak. Before the next battle, then, the Israelites repaired to Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. The narrator at that point lets us know two things. One, that the Israelite God is enthroned on the cherubim, presumably also in the Ark, and two, that Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were at that time with the Ark of the Covenant. That's in verse 4 of chapter 4. In any case, the Israelites were confident before this next battle, since they were accompanied by the Ark and therefore by God. When the Ark arrived, where the Israelite army was deployed, the soldiers all shouted. Obviously, they were encouraged. As it turns out, the Philistines also believed that the Israelite God had made an appearance. They too believed that the Israelite God was, quote-unquote, in the box. That's in verses 5 and 6. They said as much when they declared, a God has come into the camp, end of quote. This made them afraid. Indeed, they figured that they were doomed for the next battle. That's in verse 7. The Philistines knew the reputation of the Israelite God. They were quite aware that this deity had taken on Egypt and visited on it all manner of plagues. That's in verse 8. Nevertheless, they had a battle to fight. So the Philistines resolved to give their best shot and confront the Israelite army for a second time. If they did not win, they might end up as slaves in bondage to these Hebrews. That's in verse 9. The battle was engaged, but once again the Philistines won. In fact, the Israelite army was routed. This time the Israelites lost 30,000 troops. No wonder every Israelite headed, headed for home as fast as possible. But the lost troops were not the only casualties. On that fateful day, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. Even worse, the Philistines managed to capture the Ark of God. That's in verses 11 and 12. Eli's two sons died just as the man of God had earlier predicted. That prediction is found in verse 34 of chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. In the meantime, word of this disaster was about to reach Shiloh. A man who lived in Benjamin ran to Shiloh with the awful news. Eli was sitting down at the time. The courier already indicated that lament was in order, for his clothes were torn and his head was covered with dirt. Both of these indicated that something dreadful had happened. When the man got to Shiloh, word spread fast. The whole city cried out in lament. Eli heard the commotion, but did not know what was taking place. He inquired about the sounds emanating from Shiloh. By then, the man arrived at where Eli was sitting. The narrator reminds us that the old priest was 98 years old and could no longer see. When the runner goes to Eli, he let the priest know that he had just come from the battlefield battlefield. Immediately, Eli wanted to know what had happened. That's in verse 16. First, the man told Eli that once again Israel had been defeated by the Philistines. Worse, the slaughter was terrible. Not only that, the courier had to tell Eli that his two sons had been killed. Finally, adding insult to injury, the Philistines had captured the Ark of God. 
When Eli heard that the ark had been captured, he fell backward, broke his neck, and died on the spot. After all, he was an old man and heavy to boot. He had been judging Israel for 40 years. The tragic scene in which Eli died by breaking his neck gives us an opportunity to observe a brilliant feature of biblical narrative. Remember that when the messenger got to Eli, we were told two things about the priest. One thing we are told is that he was sitting on the seat, seat, sitting on the seat. That's in verse 13. The RSV translates that he was sitting on his seat, but that is not what the Hebrew has. The Hebrew text say, states unambiguously that Eli was sitting on the seat. As a matter of fact, once before in this story, we are informed that Eli was sitting on the seat. This detail is found in chapter 1, verse 9. 4.13 says this also in spite of the RSV's mistranslation. A final time that we are made aware that the priest was sitting on the seat is in verse 18 in chapter 4, once again mistranslated by the RSV. I will return to this topic after mentioning the second thing we are told about Eli being on the seat, namely that he was watching for the ark. But how can a blind man watch for anything? Keep in mind that in 4.15, the narrator let us know that Eli was 98 years old and could not see. As strange as that is, there is even something stranger. The three times in the broader context that we are told that Eli was sitting on the seat, that's in verse 9 of chapter 1 and cha verses 13 and 18 of chapter 4, the word for seat is kise, a word that means throne in Hebrew. This word normally refers to a seat that either a king or a queen occupies, or, metaphorically speaking, a seat reserved for God, who is sitting on a heavenly throne and exercising royal functions. The word is never used to describe ordinary, everyday furniture. Using this odd nomenclature begins to make sense when we consider what Eli is, was doing the three times he was occupying the seat, or more literally, Hakisei, the throne. In the first reference, verse 9 of chapter 1, Eli was sitting on the seat when he was unable to distinguish between a woman who was praying and a woman who was drunk. That suggests myopic spiritual insight. In the second reference, verse 13 of chapter 4, we learn that Eli was watching for the ark while he was sitting on the seat. By now, he was not merely spiritually myopic, but blind. The third time Eli is depicted sitting on the seat, we cannot help but notice his reaction to the messenger's terrible news. When he was told that the Israelites had lost the battle, that they suffered dreadful losses, and that his two sons had been killed, there was no reaction. However, when he was informed that the Ark of God had been captured, at that very point, he fell, broke his neck, and died. It turns out that the seat symbolizes an office, or exercising, exercising the duties of an office. We have many examples of this even in the English language. Someone runs for a seat in the United States Senate. Everyone knows that this seat will allow that person to exercise power. A judge rules from the bench, another way of describing judicial authority. When the Roman Catholic Pope speaks ex cathedra, which means from the chair, that means that his utterance is absolutely true. If one is in charge of a committee, one is said to be 
the chair. In sum, holding an office or exercising power is often indicated by using the metaphor of sitting or occupying a certain chair. When the furniture is a throne, we have no trouble envisioning a king or queen ruling. So, why is Eli pictured these three times on the throne, especially in light of the fact that priests do not typically sit on thrones? Mostly, this is to emphasize that Eli is not exercising appropriate authority. As a priest, he failed to discern that Hannah was praying. Instead, he thought she was inebriated. As a priest, he was watching for the ark, even though he could not see. His lack of spiritual discernment had devolved into spiritual blindness. The last scene tells us everything we need to know. He did not react to the news that Israel had been defeated by the Philistines or that his two sons had been killed. Only when he heard about the ark of God's capture did he fall, break his neck, and die. This underscored the complete bankruptcy of the, his priesthood, and that is why the priesthood is in the process of being replaced by a prophetic ministry. One other point needs to be made. In Israel, the throne, the ultimate seat, was reserved for a legitimate king. Curiously, not even Saul ever sat on the throne. The first king who sat on the Israelite throne was David. For now, though, we witness this disappointing scene of Israel's defeat, the death of Eli's sons, and the death of Eli himself. Do not forget for a moment that all of this is happening during a prophet's pregnant pause. Let me encourage you to go to my website, faspina.com. Let me know what your email is. And if you'd like me to answer a question in a uh, Q&A session, email me at fspina106 at gmail.com. I want to thank you so very much for listening to The Bible You Thought You Knew. I have a question for you. Do you have a question or topic that you'd like me to cover on the podcast? If so, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do two simple things. One, leave a rating and review telling me what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to the Bible. That's all you have to do. Then, listen in to hear your question answered on a future episode. Join us next time on The Bible You Thought You Knew when we discuss Jesus' personal Bible. God bless.